let me uh, have the pleasure of saying a few words about Tom Stevenson, our speaker tonight. His articles and photographs are in museums and many publications, uh, including Birding, Birdwatcher Digest, Handbook of Birds, Handbook of Mammals of the World, and Guide to the Birds of Southeast Brazil. He's lectured and guided many groups across the US, as well as in Asia, where he trained guides for the government of Bhutan. He has donated many recordings of Eastern Himalayan rarities and other Asian specialties to Cornell's Macaulay Library of Natural Sounds. He was on Zeiss's digiscoping team for the World Series of Birding. And in 2011, he had the great fame. He is, his and Scott Whittle's team won the World Series Cape Island Cup. And in 2014, they set the US record for a photo big day. And just another thing that kind of ties into the bird song teaching he's gonna give us tonight. Uh, Tom Stevenson is a musician. He's played concert and did studio work for many years, working with several Grammy and Academy Award winners. His clients included the Grateful Dead, Bill Collins, and the FBI. He joined Roland Corporation in 1991, managed the recorder division, and re then retired from there as director of technology. His highly acclaimed book, The Warbler Guide, co-authored with Scott Little, is published by Princeton University Press. And if you don't know about that guide or the incredible app, you definitely wanna check it out. It's, it's quite extraordinary in its design and approach. So Tom, we're delighted to have you with us tonight to teach us about birdsong. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks to Lisa Curtis for setting this up with Anne. Um, you guys have great attention to detail. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really great. And it's wonderful to see all these activities that are going on as well. That's, that's uh, with all the Audubons, that's, that's really exciting and, and encouraging. Um, so yes, we'll talk about uh, bird songs. I'm gonna sort of take a few different approaches here, um, but we're gonna start um, uh, by just talking about their songs a little bit. Um, as you know, um, our warblers have some really cool songs. This is a yellow-throated warbler, which is one of the first birds we might see as a migrant. They're actually overshoots because they're basically breeding south of us, but we get them in Prospect Park regularly and um, more so recently as the, everything warms up a little bit. But, uh, um, so one beautiful descending song. Uh, volume okay on that, everybody? Good to, yeah, good. Um, this uh, Cerulean Warbler has a wonderful buzzy song. Um, the Sonitary, another bird we might see sometime soon. Some of our uh, species, this we kicked this one out of the Warblers because it was kind of the song was a little ugly. But uh, here we go with the chat song. <laughs> It's actually a pretty cool song. And this is one of my favorite songs. This is not a North American bird. It's a musician, Ren, but this, I had to play this just as an example of a cool bird song. It's kind of like uh, Schoenberg made it with a with a white-throated sparrow or something. Anyway, um, great songs. So it takes a lot of energy to sing, um, as you can tell from this uh, winter wren here. And uh, that's also a wonderful song. Um, so since, it's, since it takes a lot of, lot of work to do that, why do birds sing? That's gonna be a topic we're gonna to cover here for a little while. What are the advantages for males? What are the advantages for females? Assuming that um, singing males uh, were encouraged by the females uh, in terms of mate choice and so on selection. Um, how many songs does an individual sing? Do birds learn their songs? Um, if so, how do they learn them and sort of how do we know what's the research that kind of comes in to uh, uh, show us what we know about birds learning their songs. Um, we'll start with that. Um, I'm going to venture a field uh, far afield here for a second. Um, and then we'll come back to a little bit more about um, maybe how humans can uh, learn to understand bird songs better and, and talk about vocabulary a little bit, depending on how our time goes here. 
So um, before we start with, with why they uh, sing and, and what the songs are like, I think it's important to know how birds sing because this really informs the sounds that we hear. It creates those sounds. And the more we understand how those sounds are created, the more precisely we can hear, I think. And, and really the message for this whole talk and, and a lot of the talks I give is just for people to listen more carefully and listen more precisely because that's what really leads to the ability to differentiate similar sounding birds and, and, and actually helps your memory as well. Um, so as you probably know, the syrinx in a bird is a structure that provides two sound sources. So this is, this is not uh, positioned in the larynx like the human voice box, it's in the two sides that sort of branch off into the lungs. So they have two distinct structures that are totally independent, independent muscles, independently controlled, and they're incredibly efficient. They're about 95%, I've seen stats of 96, 97% efficient versus humans at about 3%, um, except for our past president, who I think was at about 20%. But uh, um, I think, uh, if humans were more like the 95%, we'd all be in big trouble. Um, so, um, and what happens because there are these two sound sources is you can get complex interactions between the frequencies of the left and right syrinxes. And that's one of the reasons that birds can create such interesting and sometimes ethereal sounding uh, vocalizations. Um, it has to do with how those two voice boxes, the, the, the syrinxes, interact. Um, also, there's research that shows that the bill and the throat can be used to filter harmonics. So um, some birds will have more harmonics, some birds uh, fewer harmonics. Um, and we'll, we'll see some examples of that shortly. Um, this is from Cornell. Cornell has a, has a little a graphic on their site of this. But just, um, just to show you here, uh, I think, uh, yeah, so, the, so the, this is where, in the, where the lungs are, and this is sort of the branching of the tube into the two lungs, which is where the syrinx is located. So it's actually in, in a branching tube. Um, and uh, this is a little better uh, illustration here. So you can see here, here's one side, here's the other side. And they're, they're controlled by um, independent muscles that, that allow um, the the error to be modulated very very fast very very quickly um here's a, here's a, a sort of an animation of this that they have at cornell um coming up here uh oh didn't play that's not good um uh okay so um in this anime i'm not sure why this didn't play this time um but um you'll see that as one sound is made here on this one side, this, this flap will open and it can vibrate very quickly and the other side is, is independent of it as well. Um, oh wait, here's the animation, sorry. It, it is playing, okay, here we go. Here it is slowed down. Oh, sorry. Full speed again and slowed down. What's, what's really interesting to me about that, that's a cardinal, as you know, um, is that um, one side is used for one part of the slur here, this, this slur that we're seeing. I'm going to stop that playing if I can. I guess I can't. I'll lose the graphic. Um, so one side is using one part, is used for one part of the upward slur, and the other side is used for the rest of the slur. And you can tell how. Uh, practiced a cardinal is by how that slur happens. So if you hear that slur and there's a gap there, a break, that's a young bird who still hasn't learned to coordinate the two sides of their syrinx. Um, and we're gonna talk more about um, hearing young birds practicing their songs and stuff in, in a bit, but um, that's something that's kind of interesting to listen for in cardinals um, because of the way they create those upward slurs. Um, before we go <laughs> into birds, um, Insects are really amazing, and they have some great songs. Um, there's a site here, this um, songsofinsects.com, that's uh, Lang Elliott and Will Hirschberger's site. Um, they have some wonderful stuff up there, and um, insects are just the 
weirdest and coolest things in the world. Um, but they have some amazing songs as well. Um, here's a Katie did song, for example. Oops, sorry. Which you probably are familiar with. And then uh, the Cicada song. Insects, unlike birds, will sometimes synchronize a whole community singing at exactly the same time. Uh, cicadas will do this. If you've ever been to Japan, you've heard this sort of rent, 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 round, and it's every single cicada in the whole, like a mile square area, all singing at exactly the same time, and it really gets into your head. <laughs> it's pretty intense. Um, okay, so that's just a little brief aside on insects, but uh, uh, they never get. Uh, enough acclaim, I don't think they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, so what kinds of sounds do birds make? Since they have this, this syrinx structure with two, two different uh, sources, um, will this help us understand what the sounds are like and, and can it help us you know, hear better and, and, and separate birds that might sound similar? Um, so bird song elements can be classified to some extent by their harmonic structure, um, by their rhythm, by their length, the length of the element, um, and so on. And I wanna show you a few types. By the way, back to insects, what's really interesting about insects, insects don't hear pitch. They have almost no ability to hear pitches. They're extremely sensitive to rhythms. So the difference between two species of uh, katydids, for example, or conids, often is in the rhythm of the sound or the speed of the trill and, and, the, and so on and not in the pitch itself. And in fact, the pitch will change based on temperature. So as it gets warmer, these birds start to, to sing um, a little bit higher pitches. And actually, if you take a female and cool her down, like put her in an ice chest or something, she won't respond to a male singing at a higher temperature, which is, which is interesting. Um, so, um, and we'll talk more about vocabulary later. In fact, this, this whole section would be probably better suited later, but I wanted to make sure we got to it in case, in case we run out of time. So um, in the Warbler Guide, if you've read that, we talk about um, the, the types of vocalizations that warblers make and what the elements are that make those up. Um, one type is a clear sound, another is a buzzy sound, another is a complex sound, a trilled sound, and I'll show you examples of all this in a minute. And for other, warblers don't do this, but also noise-based sounds as well. And the more we understand and can hear the differences between those, it gives us sort of a toehold in describing a sound and in um, you know, comparing it to other sounds that might be different in, in, in terms of how they're created. So just a, <clears throat> a quick basic lesson in harmonics, because I'm throwing that term around and, and just to, if you've forgotten your high school physics, um, harmonics um, are, the overtones are often called of a, a basic signal and, and a basic sound. And actually in birds, that's, that's not totally the case, but in terms of strings, stringed instruments and so on, you've got the fundamental pitch, which is basically the pitch of the whole string. And the first harmonic is double that frequency. So it's basically the, the, the string vibrating, um, as it vibrates as one, it also vibrates as two. So, um, and this actually happens in real time, depending on the, the source and the type of string and so on. Um, and then the fourth, uh, the third harmonic is actually a doubling of that again. So that's four times the frequency of the fundamental tone. And these, these harmonics uh, make the sound richer or, uh, you know, sound more, um, uh, can be sound more harsh if there are sort of the odd harmonics are used and not the even harmonics. Um, here's an example um, just to show you. This is uh, a fundamental tone here. Um, fundamental first harmonic, which is double the frequency, and the, and the third harmonic, which is four times the frequency or double the second frequency. And then I've stacked them together so you can just sort of hear the effect. Um, So you can hear that the sound is, is a little bit different when you have extra harmonics. Um, and it depends on how they're balanced and so on. But uh, 
just just sort of as a basic thing. And and by the way, um, at, at the end of each one of these sections, we'll have a time for questions. So if if I'm going over something too quickly or or it's confusing, um, there'll be time to catch up in, in a bit. Um, so here's a sound, uh, a bird song, that's a clear sound. And by clear, um, I define clear as a sound that you could whistle that, that basically has regular harmonics, just like a regular string might have, which would be double the frequency and then double it again and so on and so forth. Um, and this is a white-throated sparrow. So that's a clear sound. It does have harmonics, which gives it a little bit more richness than if it didn't. Um, as I mentioned, birds can filter their harmonics with their bill and throat. So a cardinal actually doesn't have so many harmonics, uh, assuming that that's how they're they're filtering uh, those out. Uh, but this this uh, white throated sparrow definitely definitely does. Um, here's here's a, a cardinal again, clear, clear sound. And even the end of that is clear also. Let me play it at half speed. So our ear can pick up the fact that those last notes, even though they're quite short, um, do have a pitch component. It doesn't sound harsh to us. It doesn't sound like noise. It sounds like a pitch, sounds like a note. And that's a very important um, characteristic to, to take note of, um, no pun intended. Um, whether the sound is using uh, many, many sounds at once, which is basically noise in a very short period of time, like a check sound, like a, like a, a blackbird or something, or like a cardinal, it's a clear sound that's just very, very short um, with potentially a lot of pitch change. Um, okay, so um, with these first two, so we have two clear sounds, examples of two clear sounds, with filtered harmonics in the case of the uh, the cardinal possibly and with the regular harmonics in the white throated sparrow here's a sound now that has lots of harmonics but they don't correspond to the rules of a stringed instrument and there are several ways that, that they're breaking the rules number one is that the loudest sound is not the lowest so what we would normally call the fundamental in a string and what we're used to hearing in a musical instrument is that the, the fundamental sound that the rest of the harmonics are built on using integral math, so twice the time, three times or, or whatever, um, is not the case with this sound. And in fact, it's very important to be able to hear where those loudest sounds are because that gives you a pitch reference that can separate a species from another species. I'm gonna show you some more examples of that in a minute, but. Um, I wonder if you anybody guess uh, what this <laughs> what this species is. Uh, here you go. So that's that's uh, a red-breasted nuthatch that has a very what we would call a nasal sound, and the nasal quality of that sound is based on this harmonic structure of having many, many very closely associated harmonics. It, notice there's no gap like there is here. Like this is, this is an integral multiplier here. No integral multiplier here at all. And it's happening because the two syrinxes are creating sounds that interact with each other and create these, this stack of, of harmonics. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, but, learning to say, all right, that, that's, that's a sound that's certainly not a clear sound, um, but it's not noise, it just has lots of odd harmonics. Um, okay, so this, this mixing of harmonics from two sources that causes this, uh, this sound for the red-breasted nuthatch and, and, and many, many other bird sounds. It's, it's sort of similar to a radio technology, if you've ever studied uh, how the original radios work, which is called heterodyning. And basically, it, it's the, the mixing of harmonics or sort of the riding of one frequency on top of another frequency that creates brand new frequencies that aren't in the original two. Um, so basically, and this is not a great diagram, but um, basically you take two frequencies that might be out of phase with each other, or maybe they're just different frequencies, and they combine to make a bunch of new frequencies because you get plus and minus of the high points and the low points um, that line up to give you all these different harmonics. 
and this is not important to understand really except if you're interested i want to i want to put it in here um, but the important thing is to hear a sound that does have lots of harmonics or does not have lots of harmonics and whether they're the regular harmonics or irregular as in that in the non hitch that that's what's important um, so here's an example of that um, you may be able to guess this sound too um, let me play it hopefully we'll be hearing this in another month or so month and a half um, so all those sounds that we would call ethereal are actually created with very clear tones. There's no noise going on in this sound at all, none. Um, and uh, it's a combination of the two syrinxes that add these harmonic, um, you can see here, for example, um, that there, there's, there's harmonics piled on top of harmonics that are very elaborate um, replicas of the, of the sound below it. Let me play this at half speed. Uh, actually, I'll just play this example. So, so that's that's sort of a a piece of this one, I guess it was. Yeah. Um, so you can hear the bouncing back and forth between the two sides of the syrinx, and also these these harmonic structures that that no human could ever create because we don't have the two voices. Here it is at quarter speed. And it's all clear sounds. There's no noise there at all of any kind. I'll play one more time. Kind of cool. All right, so let's talk about noise a little bit. Excuse me one second. Um, Noise, it basically lots of frequencies at one time. And our ear doesn't like to not understand what it's hearing. So if we're hearing a pitch like, or even really fast like that cardinal, as long as our ear can sort of parse it out and go, yeah, I know what that is. That's, that's a you know, fast sound or whatever, we're happy. But when we hear noise, we can't distinguish what's going on basically. And so those kinds of sounds tend to sound harsh to us or like accents or, or sort of less musical people would call them, you know, well, noise, <laughs> actually. So, um, and uh, this noise can be wideband noise, meaning all, many, many frequencies all at once, um, which, which really sounds harsh to us, or they can have some pitched component. Like this sound clearly has a pitched component here. You can see there's more energy right here. These are spectrograms, by the way. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what a spectrogram is, which is probably a bad assumption, but um, basically we're looking at time going this way, frequency going this way. And a lot of other talks that, that we do, you know, we talk about song structures and, and, and how we use um, spectrograms to, to help us understand them and see them. Um, the World of Guide, if, you, if you've seen that, we're, is, is the first field guide to really use spectrograms to show the structure of warbler songs, which really helps with understanding the songs and separating similar species and so on. So anyway, so this is noise, which is lots of frequencies at the same time. Okay. So our ear doesn't, doesn't like that as much as we like those sound typically for, for most people. Now, if you're into heavy metal music, uh, I mean, that may not be the case. I, I had the, this is really an aside, but I had an interesting experience. I got contacted by this heavy metal TV show. And they, it's a very popular show, apparently. I knew nothing about it, but um, uh, although I did have worked with a couple of heavy metal groups in the studio, but, but anyway, they, what they wanted to do is they wanted me to find bird songs that corresponded to the sounds of the lead singers of some of these groups. And if you, if you Google, I think it's called One Minute Before Midnight or something like that. Um, uh, it's it's quite, quite an interesting segment. But uh, anyway, uh, there's a lot of noise in some of those singers, which, which we don't typically associate with, let's say opera, for example. Um, anyway, so um, here's another sound. Now this sound is not really um, 
a, a, a sort of a long noise. It's a fast repeated um, iteration of a noise element. So let me play it again. You can hear that there's repetition. You can see it clearly in the spectrogram as well. Um, but what's important about that is that there's a difference between this first one and the second one. And the first one, play it again. First one is a continuous sound. It's not broken by any pauses or iterations. The second sound is clearly multiple sounds going on, right? Like just the same repetition of many, many different sounds, which is the difference between a trill and a buzz, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this is not a clear sound. This is not like a chipping sparrow trill or any kind of warbler trill. This is, this is noise. So here are short bursts of noise, which basically kind of attack our ears again. Where our ears are not, uh, we can't tell what that pitch is, and, and it sort of sounds like um, something that can be a little bit, uh, you know, harsh or whatever you might call it. Um, again, noise can be pitched. This is a lower pitched noise. So it's the same concept. It's a little bit lower pitched, though because there's more energy in the lower frequency range here in the second one. Um, to make this a little bit uh, more uh, practical, here's the call of a great blue heron. Um, and here's a call of a great egret. So they're, they're, they're fairly similar. The egret in this particular case is a longer call, but it doesn't always, it's not always longer. Um, but what you can see in this, and I'm going to show you another representation, which is not a spectrogram. This is called a spectral slice, which is basically where I'm taking a look at all the frequencies at one moment in time. So maybe I'm looking at this moment in time here and maybe this moment in time here. But you can clearly see um, that this great blue heron has a lot more low frequency sound than the egret. So at this one moment in time, the egret has a lot more high frequency sound than, than the heron, actually. Um, so let me play them again, just so you can hear them again, take a listen. So one is higher than the other because there's more energy in that upper, upper frequency range and much less in the low frequency range. So learning to hear that difference is, is an important way of distinguishing sounds that can have very similar characteristics in every other respect. Um, here's a lower call by a great blue heron. There's the, the great egret's response to that. And you can see again um, that, the, that on the right here, the, the egret has a lot more energy in the high frequency, almost none in this, this low frequency range where the, the uh, great bull heron has a lot and not much in the high frequency. Anyway, um, I, this is not something that you're going to probably go home and, and work up for all your bird songs, but I'm using it to try to point out the, these differences so that you can try to um, you know, think about how you might hear them and how you might want to um, go about studying the songs and the sounds. Um, another type of um, sound. So here's some clear sounds, but the length of the sound and how, how fast the sound happens to our ear really affects the difference in how we perceive the species. So here's a common yellow throat. So it has very slow pitch changes. That's, that's slow down half speed. Um, so there's not really any anything, uh, there's no noise in there, it's all clear stuff, and it's all very slurred like a cardinal's. Now, if we take a listen to a Carolina Wren, which has an almost identical structure, so this, this song here is taking three elements and repeating them as a three element phrase three times. Carolina Wren, same thing, three elements repeated three times. They might have four elements or five, or as, as, as can the common yell throat. But take a listen to the difference in the sound. So, half speed. 
So the difference is that in every single Carolina Wren song that I've looked at, and I've looked at lots of them, um, there is one element where there are lots and lots and lots of fast pitches. This is not noise. It's like the Cardinal in a way, but because there are so many fast sounds at once, it, it creates an accent for our ear. And that is how you separate common yellow throat from, from Carolina Wren, because common yellow throat never has an accent like that. Carolina Wren always has an accent like that. And all their songs. So you don't have to learn their songs, which would be very difficult to do, um, since they have a wide range of variation. Um, but anyway, hopefully that makes sense. Let me keep moving here. Another thing to notice. And because the birds have two syrinxes, they can actually combine noise and clear elements at the same time. And that's another clue to certain types of vocalizations. So here is a common grackle. I'm gonna play it again. So you can kind of hear the clear sound and the noise happening at the same time. Here's another example. So that's different than the noise signature of say a uh, redwing blackbird or other similar sounding, uh, even some of the great tail grackles and stuff. Um, it's this combination of clear, okay? So you can see, remember what the, what the um, white-throated sparrow looked like. There's a clear element, another clear element, clear element, clear element with harmonics, regular harmonics there and noise. And the only way that they can really do that is because of the two syrinxes. Um, so you can see right here, there's clear sounds embedded in noise, in fact, uh, right there. Okay, hopefully this is not too technical, but uh, we're gonna get to, to the more fun stuff in a minute. Um, trills are something else to, to understand. Trills are fast repetition, repetitions of clear sounds, typically, um, but they're too fast to count. Like a chipping sparrow or Okay, you can hear that there's separate elements there, that that's not one continuous sound. It's definitely the repetition of something, but you would be able to tell how many repetitions there are. A buzz, on the other hand, is more like noise. Um, and it, it, it blends together, so our ear can't distinguish the different elements. So black-throated blue warbler. And you can also, also notice the clear sound embedded in the noise itself, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, okay. Um, if you slow this way down and pitch it down also, sounds like an owl trill, like a tropical screech owl or something like that. So that's that exact sound slowed down, just the middle, middle element. Um, and you can, tell that that's not noise because it's a repetition. So it's actually a trill just so fast our ear can't distinguish it. And we can't even hear any of the gaps at all. But when you slow it down, there are gaps clearly. But uh, uh, noise is not like that. Noise is just lots of frequencies at once. Okay. All right, take a first break here. From now on, it gets a lot easier. But I, I really wanted to, I, I know a lot, a lot of you have heard some of my other talks about learning songs and so on. So I wanted to bring in some new new material here, um, you know, just just for for people who've, who've seen other stuff, and then we're going to get into uh, how birds uh, learn their songs. Any questions that we should address now? Come on. There uh, was a question about. Um, yeah, some people are having a little trouble with their audio. I think most people are hearing the song, so you need to kind of troubleshoot that on your com on your computer end, folks. Somebody asked what equipment do you prefer to use for recording? I don't know if you want to get into that um, so much now. I think some folks were hoping they would hear, um, if you could be sure to repeat the bird name and maybe even play the sound twice. They're trying to keep up with you on that. Thank okay. You. Sorry, I know I was I was buzzing through there, um, uh, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, for for other instances like that, I'll I'll try and do that. Okay, and uh, yeah, a lot of folks following close closely behind you. Um, Oops, I hope it's not. 
No, no, no. All good. Um, somebody has a bigger question. Can we just stick a pin in this about why mockingbirds mock? Because we don't want we want you to keep moving on your. I, I'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Yeah, I, that would yeah, be good. Later on. Uh, somebody asked for a repetition of yellow throat and wren, but let's 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 keep moving, folks, and we can circle back. Yeah, we probably should. This has a um, question about the software uh, for analyzing frequency. So let's let's hold those tech ones to the end, if that's okay, Tom. Yeah, um, I can just quickly say um, Raven, Cornell's Raven Light, which is a free software, is good for for looking at spectrograms, um, and you can get spectral slices with that also. And in terms of recording equipment, um, Zoom recorders, any of the any of the commercial um, little portable digital recorders are pretty good. And the Sennheiser ME66 K6 combination is is sort of the the go-to shotgun mic that people use if you're not using a parabola, which which is much more expensive than bulky and so on. Uh, hopefully that. A quick helps. question for a quick answer, if it seems good to you, uh, about whether ducks have a syrinx. <laughs> yeah, I think all, all birds have that structure. I think you know. I I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure on that actually. Okay, is it Certainly okay? Certainly all the passerines do, and all yeah. of the, the learner songs, and, and most of the, yeah. Somebody I said, has there been analysis of how different birds specifically angle their bill and throat for certain sizes? Certain sizes, are birds? And that question. Don't know, but uh, birds do use, as I mentioned, the bills for filtering, so sometimes that does require a certain movement of the head, I think, uh, head, and, head and throat. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move on. So let's get back to why birds sing. Um, since it costs a lot uh, of energy to vocalize, why bother? Well, some reasons are birds are up there on their territory and they need to attract a mate. And hopefully the best possible mate that they can get for their, for their status. Um, they also need to claim a territory and maintain that territory throughout the breeding season. Um, and songs actually help birds avoid conflicts and actual fights because the birds will develop um, knowledge of their neighbors and where those boundaries are and they sort of stick to those and then if they get a third party in we'll talk more about how they will know that in a minute um, then they'll all gang up on the third party um, they're also used to alert other birds to predators and, and coordinating uh, flights at night and the migration and so on um, are some of the reasons that we know about. I'll explain a few more in a second uh, in terms of the chaffinch, which has been highly studied. Um, so why do warblers sing? Now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on warblers because we know a little bit more about warbler song actually than we do some of these other species. Um, so attracting a mate. Most warbler species have one main song they use to attract a mate. Anybody, well, there's nobody I can ask, <laughs> but think about why that is. And the reason is the male doesn't know where the female is coming from. So if it had a specialized song that was localized, the female might not recognize it. Females do learn the songs in the nest. They just don't sing. So they know their species song. And in particular, they know the, the mate attraction song. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons for that. And I'll show you some, some examples of studies of that in a second. So there's your warbler. That's the mate attraction song for yellow warbler. Um, um, how do we know, this is, uh, I already answered the first part. How do we know? Because uh, researchers will go in, they'll take the female out of the territory and the male starts singing that mate attraction song again like crazy. You put the female back in, he stops singing the mate attraction song as much, starts singing the boundary songs more. Um, so that's kind of the, the way the research was done on that. Um, so singing also benefits females because it helps them evaluate the, the sort of the health and fitness of the males that they're listening to. And they use song to evaluate this fitness um, some of the ways that have been studied are the song's volume and pitch make a difference, how often the bird sings, the size of the bird's repertoire, depending on what species and so on. Um, and uh, there are the experiments that, that, that use, you know, different size repertoires and can see how many more females are attracted and so on and so forth. Um, since singing is a costly activity, if you're singing a lot, 
you can't really feed and sing loudly at the same time. So that means you must be pretty good at getting food or you must have a really good territory because you've got more time on your hands for seeing. So that's one of the, the flags for, for health that, that um, females use. Um, loud sounds are easier to, to detect. So if you're singing loudly, you must be good at escaping because predators could find you more easily. Um, it implies health also. It, it's shown that if, if a bird has a, a large parasite load, they don't sing nearly as much. Um, it, it taxes their energy and uh, um, they, they sing a lot less. Um, in, in some cases where there are learned songs uh, that, that extend into li the lifespan, like a mockingbird, for example, or boundary songs, um, a repertoire, a larger repertoire, implies that this bird has been around for a while. So if they've been around for a while, that means they probably um, are good at surviving, they've got good genes um, worth mating with. Um, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, there are studies now where we've sort of located where the, where the singing center is in the brain and birds that have large repertoires have a larger uh, singing song center in their brain. Um, and uh, that in order to develop that, you need to practice, you need to listen to other birds and, and must have a productive territory or you wouldn't have that kind of time. Uh, also, females use the muscle t-shirts, mostly in the mannequins, but um, uh, anyway, uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so another reason, so that's the mate attraction side. Uh, other birds, uh, all birds really try to stake out and claim a territory. And as I mentioned before, it's less expensive to sing than to fly around policing your boundaries. So if you had to, if you had to go around the boundaries all the time um, and, and, you know, fight your neighbor all the time, you really wouldn't have a lot of, a lot of time left for feeding and so on. So everybody benefits from kind of knowing where everybody is. And birds are very good at telling how far away a song is, by the way. Um, so they can kind of tell where that bird is in relation to themselves. Um, so my motto is don't build a wall, just uh, sing more in terms of your, your boundaries. Um, most warblers have one mate attraction song, as I mentioned, but they have several defense songs, meaning territorial defense songs. So why more? Anybody, uh, if we were live, we, I'd be asking people if they could explain that. Um, uh, the reason is um, the larger repertoire um, may serve to keep neighbors more alert. In other words, bird, birds can get inured to one song and they kind of get used to it and then they kind of can encroach possibly. Um, but another thing that happens uh, regularly with warblers especially, and some other, lots of other species actually, is that um, once your neighbor has a repertoire that you know, you kind of know that bird. And uh, that way you know your neighbor, your neighbor knows you, and you, you're sort of, you've, you've established detente as it were. Um, and this happens with lots of warblers that have localized boundary songs, which I'll show you a map of in a second. Um, but having this local learned boundary repertoire helps birds, um, you know, and sort of know what's going on in their neighborhood. And then if a bird comes in and starts singing a song that's not, not the song of that neighborhood, then both, both species might gang up on it, and, or both, I mean, both the neighbors, I mean, might gang up on it. And uh, so it sort of maintains this uh, sort of knowledge map of, of your territories. Um, uh, also, healthy returning females can recognize local dialects. So if they grew up in that area, they learned those songs and they know that you know them and you've returned and you're sort of a survivor. So that's, that's another flag for health and, um, and so on. Okay, so we have to have a couple pictures here. It's too much text so far. I think I took these in Prospect Park. Um, Anyway, just inside a warbler. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's the mate attraction song, which everybody probably knows. Here's an example of the boundary protection songs. And these are the songs that people get confused with a lot. So this song, lots of people know, the Pleased to Meet You song, although Yellow Warbler can do a very close imitation of that. Typically, the difference in the Yellow Warbler is that they don't have four elements in the first section, they only have three. 
and it's a, a little bit less emphatic um, at the end sometimes. Um, but here's a boundary protection song for a Chestnut Cider Warbler. These are often call, called unaccented songs, the main attraction being an accented song. It kind of peters out a little bit. Another one. Another one. Another one. Those are all boundary songs. They're not the main attraction songs. And they also do calls. So there's a, a contact call and a, and a, and a flight call. Um, just to be clear. Um, so here's a map of made attraction songs across the Eastern US. So these are spectrograms of the made attraction songs in these different areas. And you take a look at these spectrograms, you'll see those made attraction songs are like virtually identical. There's slight, slight differences, but not much. Um, on the other hand, here are all the boundary songs for one location. And there are multiple songs there, um, different songs. Um, so that's just sort of some of the research that's been done on, on this. Um, how many songs might an individual bird sing? Okay, so that really varies with the species. So one male brown thrasher can have, uh, I've read, they say this is the most songs of any bird uh, in the US anyway, but um, I'm not totally sure that's true, but it can have like 2000 songs, which are basically combinations of different elements, many of which have uh, learned elements um, from their environment, so other bird songs. So um, we're going to talk about learning songs in a minute, but um, all birds in this passerine group learn their songs. Most birds stop learning after a very short period of time, like sometimes only like a few weeks, and then they're done. And if they don't learn the song, then they'll never be able to sing. Some species, however, like this brown thrasher, continue to learn throughout their whole life, and that's, that includes the mockingbird. So a mockingbird will continue to learn new songs um, based on environmental sounds and so on throughout the rest of its life. And its fitness as a mate is often judged by the size of that repertoire. So um, because a larger repertoire means they've been alive longer, they're, they're survivors and so on and so forth. Um, I guess if they get to be geriatrics, then that might be a problem, I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> um, example. Okay, so a marsh wren can have over 100 songs. So not as many as a brown thrasher, but a lot of songs. And again, these are sort of recombinations of, of elements. Um, I don't know how long they continue to learn. I'm not sure. Um, there's been research on that or not. How many else are in the background? So um, what's interesting about the marsh wren is that the neighbor learns their, their neighbor's songs. And they not only learn the songs, but they learn the order that the songs are sung in. And let me blow this up a little bit. So this is done by a researcher where he, he sort of took spectrograms of all the songs and had numbers for all of them. And then he, he recorded many singing bouts and found that, that this bird went from 105 to 43 to 24 to 71 to 47. Occasionally started with 114 and then it continued on this path and so on and so forth. Its neighbor would hear 105, it would do 105 or then it would jump to 43, then 24, then 71, then 47. So this neighbor is essentially learning the order of this, this other neighbor's song and then sort of uh, hopping in front of it in a sense, or, you know, signaling that, hey, I know who you are, you know who I am, everything is cool, we got our territories, we're, we're all good. But to me, that's a fascinating fact that, that the bird could learn this order of the songs of its neighbor in such, a, such an intricate way. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, okay, sometimes it's called song jumping or matching. Um, so, uh, the number of songs an individual sings varies a lot by the species, as I mentioned. So, tipping sparrows, each male sings only one song. That's it. They only sing one song. 
So here's a mapping of a whole bunch of different territories. Uh, I've forgotten where this was, but um, so you've got a song there by that male, song there by that male, song by that male, so on and so forth. Um, so each each song is different than their neighbors, but they're unique. Um, and uh, I can't read the top of the screen because the um, mute and all that's in there. <laughs> um, so um, song characteristics do vary by by species and by habitat, um, and that has to do with the the frequency content and so on of the different um, songs. So a high frequency um, song like think uh, cedar waxing or something um, and more complex songs also typically are sung by birds that sit tall high in a tree or sing while they're flying or they're in very open habitats and the reason for that is that foliage interferes with high frequency transmission um, because if you think about a high frequency it's going really fast like this and if it bumps into stuff it sort of disintegrates. Um, low frequency sound can travel very far. And if you think about the subsonic sounds of like elephants, for example, they can travel for miles. Um, that's a, that's a, a better example of it in a way. Um, but we have the same thing going on with, with birds. Um, so that, that birds that tend to be in, in forested areas on the understory and so on, places with lots of vegetation, tend to sing low frequency songs. And that can be an interesting clue to the species sometimes um, as well. So um, the other thing is in dense areas, birds sing simpler songs because song structure can be masked by, by the reflections and so on um, also. So you get reflections off the leaves and, and so on. And, and you can hear that in recordings. Like if you, you listen to the recordings uh, in the Cornell's, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, master set or whatever. Um, you can actually hear reflections of the bird songs in the foliage if you're listening carefully. Um, so, uh, so again, more more complex repeated songs are better in open areas. They're not as distorted by uh, temperature and everything, um, and they degrade predictably over space. So, birds can kind of tell how far away a singer is located, which I which I mentioned before. Um, okay, so just just to bring this to a visual uh, <laughs> reinforcement. Um, so you get a Cape May warbler singing a very high, clear, high song like that tends to be high in the tree. Very complex song, lots of high frequencies. Again, bird that tends to stay up up top. Um, um, water thrush, on the other hand, lower song, um, not super complex, um, or quintessential would be ruffed grouse. Or it's it's quote unquote song is super low frequency, it may not come through this your speaker in the in the computer even. Um, okay, um, so how many songs per species? The chaffinch was very well studied by a guy named Peter Marler. Um, excuse me, he's a British. He um, did a lot of early um, research into bird songs and singing and learning and so on. Um, he found that the chaffinch had 12 adult vocalizations that were discernible by him. Seven were only used in the breeding season. Six were used only by males. One was only by females. Um, and the inventory included a flight call, social contact call, so like a, like a regular chip call that a warbler might have, an injury call, an aggressive call, alarm calls when there was some predator. In fact, I think he found that that um, they could distinguish between predator above or predator below, meaning like a snake or a, or a raptor, um, danger, or if you just escaped a threat. Um, so courtship, courtship uh, songs, ambivalence towards copulation. I assume that's the females' uh, song, I'm pretty sure. Um, ready for copulation, territorial ID, and courtship songs, and so on. So it's it's very interesting study. Um, here are some of the examples of of, of his work here um, in the different um, different call types. Uh, most of them are short calls. Um, um, why do warblers use chip calls? Um, yeah, good question. 
uh, I think it's not totally understood. There's lots of things about bird vocalizations that's not known. I mean, lots. And I'll talk about that in a second in terms of what you might want to try um, yourself. But um, we assume that one reason is sort of contact with, with your group or your spouse, if you're in a pair. Um, these calls are short and expanded, sort of broad frequency calls that are easy to localize. So that means if, if you're chipping, you can be found, uh, which is not such a great thing if, you have a, if you're doing an alarm call, um, easier than texting. Um, it lets other males know you're, know you're around. Um, you know, it's lower energy than singing. So that's another, another reason um, might be around. Here's a contact call of a, of a red star, which we hear a lot in the field. It's, they're very vocal um, in the flight call. So um, yellow warbler, contact call, flight call. Um, some chip calls to listen for. So this is just sort of a, a something. If you're going to study calls and haven't already, I'd highly recommend using these. And I'm going to list here in a second. Um, a black throat of blue has a very distinct call. I hear it more in the fall than I do in the, the uh, spring, um, but they're, they're pretty vocal in the fall, especially. It's a very short call, almost like your, your fingernail, like going kick, kick. <laughs> um, Yellow rump, Myrtle Warbler, they, as everybody knows, they call constantly. It's a very flat call. Um, there is some frequency change in this, as you can see here. But by and large, most of the energy is focused right in this one area. The Audubon, on the other hand, has a very rising call, quite a different contact call. And if you're in California, and I guess some people uh, on this uh, call are in California, you can find a Myrtle very fast using the calls because this rising Audubon call is extremely distinctive and this flat call is totally different, um, very, very different. Um, the red start call I mentioned before, listen to the difference there, the common yellow throw there, they call all the time. It's a modulated call that has a lot of noise-like component in it. Morning warbler, it's a good way of finding morning warblers, this call, I've done that in Prospect Park a number of times. It's a rising call. So it's, 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 um, and if you, if you do want to study calls, and I know we're really getting all over the place here with this, uh, this lecture, but if, if you want to study calls, um, using spectrograms really helps because it helps guide your ear in listening to what the, the profile of the song is. This American Red Star call is clearly descending and it's very clear. You can see there's just a clear pitch like a cardinal. This sound is rising, but it's not clear at all. That is not a clear sound like this Red Star. I'll go back to the red star here. That is like a whistle. You can whistle that. Can't whistle that. Can't whistle that. Um, and again, the more you hear this stuff, the more you'll you'll recognize the pitch, the pitch shapes and the qualities. And one of the ways I that I've recommended people do this is that they just take like four or five of these and just play them all the time. Play them during the day, just play them. Don't, don't try to learn them, just play them and just listen and play and listen and play and listen. And pretty soon you're gonna go, ah, that one, I know that's different than the rest of them. And then, you know, maybe figure out what it is and, and so on. And then, um, you know, put that away and then you'll do it again with the next one, like come the L throw, it's pretty flat, modulated, nothing sounds like that really, um, and so on. So that's, that's one of the ways of sort of entering into the call, call world as it were. Hooded warbler, very clear, very flat sound. Northern water thrush, very uh, loud often, like a cardinal almost. Um, Wilson's warbler, uh, the, the, that's a good way to find Wilson's warbler also. This descending call, it's a lot like the, the common yell throw call because it's sort of a, sort of a complicated uh, structure, but uh, it's falling. Hear the falling? Okay. So alarm calls. So alarm calls um, are used to alert a flock. And, and it, I guess it's an evolutionarily uh, useful thing because many, many birds do this. Um, and they want to do it without giving away their location. So alarm calls are thin, 
narrow frequencies. Remember that the contact calls are wide frequencies, um, wide frequency ranges because they're easier to lo localize. But these thin, high, narrow frequencies are difficult to localize. And actually longer durations are more difficult also because your ear doesn't, you know, sort of gets confused um, what birds do. Um, and what's interesting is alarm calls tend to converge to similar calls across species. So in other words, this species doesn't pay attention to the other species songs, but they do pay attention to other species alarm calls because they're very much like their own alarm calls. Um, so here's a robin's alarm call. Okay, long, thin, not much frequency change. Here's a European blackbird. Very similar, very similar, so related. Um, tip mouse. Chickadee. Very similar alarm calls. High, thin, almost the same, same frequency. Um, so in nesting colonies also, birds use the calls. This is like not something we're gonna be seeing anytime soon around here, but... Um, uh, I took this video in uh, Antarctica on the trip, but uh, if you have a chance to go, go. It's, it's amazing. Uh, there's a more isolated call. Um, these are king penguins. And th these birds are in a colony of like 150,000, and they can actually find their own young with the, based on the call, which is mind boggling to me. But, um, so why do birds use flight calls? So remember I mentioned flight calls earlier. I showed you examples from the yellow warbler and the red star. Um, so one is, you know, if you're flying at night, you can't see necessarily easily. So the calls sort of help you not bump into people um, as birds are migrating at night. They're pretty low energy calls also. Um, during the day, um, it's very interesting. If you if you watch a bunch of warblers for a while, you will often find one give a flight call and then wait. And if other birds give the flight call, then the whole flock is going to take off. If not, then the bird goes back to feeding. It's almost like a "Are we ready to leave yet?" kind of a, a, a vocalization, which is which is very interesting. And again, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about um, are sort of just um, suggestions for things to listen for when you're in the field. And we're going to get into a bunch more of those in a minute. But um, anyway, this flight call thing, I think is really interesting. Um, you really, uh, you know, once you start thinking about that, you can notice it a lot. Um, uh, yeah, and again, if no one joins and they fall silent and so on and so forth. Um, uh, some species use their flight calls during the day a lot more than others. Um, for example, in the fall, the black hole uses almost exclusively their flight call. They almost never use their chip call. Um, it's, it's the, that's a call you really want to know in the fall because it's, it's a very common. Um, a modulated call, fairly flat. A magnolia warbler, another bird rising call, um, also um, pretty commonly used in the spring and fall. But, um, Black pole, you don't usually hear that flight call in the in the um, summer migration or spring migration really very often. Um, okay, so I feel like I may be blasting through this kind of fast, but um, <laughs> uh, why don't we stop here for a second and see if there are any questions on this last section, why birds sing and sort of the number and types of vocalizations and so on. Then we'll get into how birds learn their songs and so on. All right, so some of the questions again are about technology um, or how birds learn their song. Uh, well, I'll get to learning in a, in a second. Yeah. Te technology, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, there was a question about uh, take on using phones or amplifiers in the field to play recordings to call the bird to you. It's about playback. Uh, playback, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a controversial one. Lisa, you want to take that one? <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, here's, here's my thought on that. Um, there are no studies that I'm aware of, and I've looked for these studies, and there have been studies trying to prove this, but there are no studies so far 
that show that playback causes lower productivity. There are actually studies that show that playback causes, uh, uh, seems to create greater productivity in a nesting area. And the theories are either that it pumps up the hormones in the males that are hearing it, and they become more macho and make more kids, or um, it attracts more females to the area. So right now, in terms of the science, there's not really much to go on to answer that question. Um, certainly, if you're in an area that's heavily birded and there are a lot of birders around, using playback is really annoying. And, you know, it, it's probably not worth doing, especially in our environment where you can hear birds and you can go and find them and so on. Um, when you're in the tropics, you will have no chance of seeing lots of birds if you don't use playback. Generally yeah, speaking. It's a difference there too, right? Um, it, just to zoop us along here, um, okay. somebody asked about, does that large repertoire, large brain size apply to birds of prey? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they're not learning their songs and no. Okay. No. Uh, three so. new, have they done any studies of birds in captive settings have different frequencies compared to their wild counterparts using the same? Yes. Birds? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute, but in the learning song part. Yep. Okay. Um, and somebody asked about female singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in the warbler group, not many females sing. Um, females tend to sing, like cardinals, for example, when the bird maintains a year-round territory. So they, they pair bond for the whole year, and they may defend them, their territory throughout the year, or most of the year. And in that case, often females sing. So there are a lot more females that sing in the tropics, for example, than up here, because here we're mostly a land of migrants. So the migrants, females aren't gonna be spending their time singing, you know, on their way to the, to the breeding territories. Um, but, but resident birds sometimes will. Um, I think, in, in there's probably studies that I don't know about, but I, I'm not sure that it's been heavily studied that I've ever seen written up. But, but basically, so, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah. So just to jump us ahead, um, okay, good. Uh, Mitchell was asking about why pishing works. Um, I, I think it it sort of uh, simulates alarm calls, so birds tend to um, pay attention to that, and. Um, if you, uh, the most effective pishing I've ever seen is um, a recording of a flock that was mobbing a, uh, a screech owl. And they just use that recording of the flock with a whole bunch of different birds given their, their um, flight calls. It's the famous call. mob call. Drew Panko has one of those. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we're good if you... Uh, are yeah, good. are we going too long? I'm sorry, Anna. I just realized. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's eight. It's eight fifteen. I think we were thinking to go to eight thirty. Okay. Yeah. Good. So let me talk a little bit about birds learning their songs. Um, as I mentioned before, the Ossian passerines do learn their songs, as do hummingbirds and parrots. Probably some other species do as well. Um, there's been research showing the bellbirds, which is basically a and non ossian pastoring, they, they tend to learn their songs, it looks like. Um, but what's known is that the, these, the ossian pastoring, which are most of the birds in the field guide after the flycatchers, so, um, uh, and hummingbirds and parrots, oddly. And to prove the parrot thing, here you go. Got this on the internet. the idea. Um, <laughs> here's another example of learn songs. Um, the starling. So clearly that guy grew up in a barn or on a farm. Um, uh, okay, so 
what methods have been used to figure out whether birds learn their songs and how they learn them? Well, one has been isolating birds at birth. Um, in other words, take them out of the nest right away and then isolate them so they don't hear any other songs. Um, there's also been experiments where they take the bird out of the nest and play them other bird songs. There have been experiments also where they take them out of the nest and play the song of their species, but change the rhythm of it or change the structure of it. And some birds respond to the rhythm and some birds respond, species respond to the structure, which, is, which I think is very interesting. Um, so um, again, playing different species songs to young birds, deafening a sub subject early or after initial learning. Um, and I've read some studies that say that, they, that it's reversible. I don't know if it's really reversible or if people would be doing that these days, but this is something that was done you know, 20 years ago or, or more. Um, so um, here's an example that shows that flycatchers don't learn their songs. The wild song of the bird, okay? Wild song of the bird, the bird isolated at birth and the bird deafened early on in this life are almost identical. No difference, very little difference. Um, the typical, typical songs. So Phoebes, are, we're pretty sure, do not learn their song. Um, they've got it from birth. No matter what happens to them, they sing the same song. Um, uh, how do birds, and I'm gonna show you some examples of, of uh, passerines in a minute, that have been isolated and so on. Um, but before that, how do birds know what song to learn? So they're sitting there in the nest up in Doodle Town or, or Sterling Forest and they're listening to, maybe it's a prairie warbler, it's listening to a field sparrow next to it and a towhee and a, you know, a blooming warbler. How does it know what, which song to learn? And it, it appears that birds have some kind of innate pattern recognition um, so that they only focus on their species song. They don't, they don't um, learn other species songs except for very rare exceptions. Um, so there was an interesting talk by Peter Grant at the Linnaean Society where he got into a little of that, which is, which is very interesting. If we have time at the end, I'll, I can talk about that. Um, they learn the songs from their father. Females also learn the songs, but they don't sing them, but they learn them and so they can recognize them. Um, then after learning the song, there's a, there's a waiting period, and this varies by species. It could be a long time or it could be a very short period of time. And then they have, what they have to do is they have to practice singing the song and listening to themselves, trying to match their memory with their actual singing. This is a crucial part of this process. And that's why when you deafen a bird, it, can't, it won't learn to sing properly, which I'll show you in a second. Um, um, so in other words, not only do they have to learn the song, but they also have to practice the song and hear themselves practicing. Um, all these stages are required if the bird's going to sound, sound normal. Um, so here's a normal song sparrow. Love those songs. Um, deaf and after initial learning. So this bird learned the song, but then it didn't get to practice listening to the listening to it. So its song is has some bears some resemblance, but it's definitely not going to get him a mate. It's not not the right song. Isolated from birth, that's what you get from a song sparrow. So um, clearly, um, there's there's that learning process is required. Um, and um, what, what, I, what I really like um, is in the way you can apply this is especially a late spring or sort of late, late winter, early spring, you can often hear birds practicing their songs. So first year males learning their songs. And I'm gonna play you a couple examples that I recorded in Prospect Park um, of this happening. Um, I hear it a lot with white-throated sparrows um, I hear it with, uh, you know, not so much shipping sparrows, uh, yellow rump warblers, a lot, a lot of different species. So here's a chipping sparrow I recorded in, I think it was early, well, maybe uh, end of April. 
So that bird clearly doesn't know how to sing. <laughs> it, it's got the repetition, it's got the rhythm down in a way, but it doesn't have the pitch, you know, consistency. Because because the Chipping Sparrow song, as you heard earlier, is, is a trill, is a trill of one element repeated over and over again. Um, here's a yellow up warbler I recorded there. So a yellow rump warbler song is kind of a little bit like the beginning of that song, but would never go on like that and also sort of trail off with this um, sort of higher buzzy almost type of sound. Here's a house wren. Sounds close. But then it kind of goes a little higher. It's got more buzzy elements. So on and so forth. Um, Okay, so the stages of this song, I'll zip through this, uh, often called sub-song, plastic song, crystallized song. Um, this is the crystallized song, meaning the final song of a swamp sparrow. Here's the sub-song, which is the initial practicing. Pretty bad. I don't know, maybe it could start his own uh, heavy metal band. Um, Here's the early plastic song. He's starting to get it, but he still falls back to the to the crazy stuff. And this is a later later plastic song. So he's trying a bunch of different things and trying to match it up with his memory. And then, of course, the final song is later, just like that. Um, so that's an example, and you can listen for that in the field again. It's 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 really worth doing and of course uh, if you've ever been on walks with me whatever or other talks uh, i think it's it's worth trying to to recognize every single sound you hear you will never be able to do it but the process is really valuable and then you'll start to um learn new stuff like you'll start hearing words learning learning their songs and you'll hear this flight call stuff going on and so on and so forth um uh so um in terms of what you can do um, I think there's lots of stuff you can do, actually, in terms of learning about orbital vocalizations. Um, and uh, one of the things that I did, I, I don't know if you, if anyone saw this, but I wrote an article for Birding Magazine on how to identify the Philadelphia Vireo song, which no one knew how to do. If you read the field guides, they say um, they sound the same, or they say one's higher than the other, which is not true at all. And it all has to do with just the structure of the song. Philadelphia Vireo has five or six elements and it repeats fairly regularly. Uh, Red-Eyed Vireo has 20 elements that it repeats much more randomly. Um, and that's just something I found by listening and, and, and taking a look at it. Um, but there are lots of things that you can do in your own neighborhood. Um, the friend of mine up in Canada, McGill, uh, is a uh, retired professor up there studied the, the red-eyed vireos in his neighborhood for five years. He, re, he recorded, he could recognize individuals, he had spectrograms of everything, and that was kind of the tip that I got about um, when I gave a talk up there. I, I um, looked at his work and he was kind enough to show me, and um, so then I started comparing that to what I knew about Philadelphia vireos. Anyway, uh, in your own neighborhood, you can just have a lot of fun just recording all the birds there. How many Chipping Sparrow songs are there in your neighborhood, for example? Um, which if you live in the suburbs up there in Westchester County, that uh, rich life up there, um, you have lots of chipping sparrows and house wrens. And, and what's the difference in the house wren songs? This is very interesting. Um, uh, are there call dialects in the area? Um, and how about breeding densities uh, and song types and, you know, dong, dong songs and so on and so forth. So here are three books I'd recommend you take a look at if you're interested, especially the Charisma. The Charisma is a fantastic book, Singing Life of Birds. It really talks about his work going in the field and just listening carefully to stuff. Um, he's really the master of that, all of that, I think. Um, Marler is, is sort of a compilation book about sort of the science of bird song and, and this Sound Approach to Birding is sort of an odd, odd book of these guys in Europe that, that record lots of stuff, but it, it was very interesting. Um, Okay, that's that's it. Um, more questions and uh, anything else that I didn't cover that uh, you'd like me to talk about?